thank you for staying everyone for the long credit in the history of movies. <laughs> so, so long. We need a lot of people to thank. Yes. It's a big production. Nassim lives in Los Angeles with his producing partner and wife, Jamie Ray Newman, where they run New Davis Pictures. So we welcome you back. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, before we start uh, diving into Volga, uh, where is he live? I want to say thank you to Bill Newman who really supported me all those years. Hilary, thank you so much for everything you did. I want to thank you for your beautiful and nerve-wracking and deeply affecting gut wrenching film. I think everybody here will agree that it definitely had you on the edge of your seat. Um, I know that challenging the audience to ask difficult questions is something that you do in your films, and they always make a statement. We talked earlier that this year marks the 50th anniversary of the Young Kippur War, which will be a time of remembrance and commemoration. Can you talk about the importance of this film? Um, I was born in May 1973. My mother went to the shelter with me. My father went to um, to the war, and, you know, I was kind of like, you know, grew up on, on war stories, and Golda, for me, was kind of an icon, like, for everybody else. Um, but I think it's like 10 years ago, the protocols and all the secrets from the, from the war uh, came out in the, you know, and, and we saw uh, a different reality that we were um, kind of like new. And that sparked the idea for Nicholas Martin, who wrote the script, to make a movie about Golda and her functioning in the war and her last days. And when I, so when I joined this um, project, it was Amazon. It was an Amazon movie. It was a massive war movie, something like, um, you know, $60 million movie with tanks and massive kind of like, it wasn't, it wasn't this intimate portrait of a lady. Um, and then, like, you know, every project went through that. Uh, the pandemic happened, and the corona happened, and the budget um, got shrunk uh, into this $15 million. And he told me, what are you going to do now? I mean, you have all this the script with this massive tank battles and all this stuff. And, and I, I basically, and I'm giving you a larger answer than you. No, that's good. Uh, that you <laughs> I grew up on films from the 70s, like The Conversation of Coppola. Um, and, you know, all those war movies from the 70s. And I wanted to, to get in under the skin of Golda. So for me, it was more into, to really dive into who Golda was and how she felt during these 10 days of the war. So for me, because she couldn't go to the front, because she couldn't fly, and they couldn't take her there um, because she was sick, she was old, she was like, she wasn't in her best, um, uh, you know, physical and mental health. She, she got the word for the sound from the front. So it was sound and I don't know if you know, but Israel was, were, was the first country that sent drones in 1973 over the, uh, the front, they, they, they invented the Dasyavi, they invented uh, the first drum. It was 1973. And that's how she got those footage from the war. So I wanted to get this, to feel what she felt, uh, trapped, being trapped into this, you know, into the bunker and between those walls with a bunch of commanders who some of them were dysfunctional. So that's, that's how we started to get into this project and after the pandemic when Amazon said we're sorry we're not very really interested in the making of telling this story it was a heartbreak uh, it was Helen Mirren who said listen I'm with you you get the money with my name I'm sticking to this project I love this project let's let's make it and that's where Liquor Street and a bank man came on board and we found ourselves in the middle of the pandemic in London shooting this film. That's great. Um, before I dive into the production and and all that other stuff, I want to go back a little bit. You said that you grew up during this war. So talk about that, that you went into the shelter with your mother. How old were you at the time of this war? And um, what image did you have of Golda growing up? 
and how do you think the perception changed in the way so there's a song, very famous song in Israel, We Are the Children of 1973. You promised us a dove with a leaf of, of you know, the peace, and, and it didn't happen, you know? Um, and that's what we grew up. But they told me when I was a kid, they told me when you grow up, there wouldn't be any, any army. There would be peace, you know? There wouldn't be any war, any army. You wouldn't even go to the army. So for me, that was kind of the reality that didn't happen. But also Golda was kind of like, a very, you know, far away character that I didn't know who she was. I mean, I didn't know really who she was until I spoke and I did the research and I spoke to Mazzini, Leon Mazzini, who was her press secretary, who's still alive, who was 91, super, you know, he's doing, what, they're coming here? Okay, they're coming here, that's amazing. So he told me that the little piece, pieces of who Golda was, and exactly, and, they, and about the secret corporation that they, brought her uh, to Adassa Hospital at 2 a.m. to get uh, uh, treatments through the boring. So, you know, he told me all those little stories that brought Golda into a different light that I didn't really know. And of course, Golda was the scapegoat of this war. Everybody blamed her. She was, a, you know, there was a, um, a paper in Israel in the, in the 70s. It's called Olam Zeng. And there was uh, uh, the photo of Golda and a big giant kind of like a statement at the buckle. So she was the face of this failure. And you know, when the protocols came out, we understood she was not the only one. And she took responsibility for what happened. So you know, I, I really wanted to show like a different light on, on kind of what happened, who God was. Okay, so let's talk about how you came to cancer. This, this started earlier back when so, yeah. So, so Helen Mirren, when I came uh, to this project, Helen Mirren was already attached because, um, you know, it was my script, it was my initiative. I, I went to, I, I competed with other directors to, to make this movie. I think that Barbara Spice was the one, someone who was also supposed to direct this movie. And, um, I came so so the one the one person that really thought about Helen Mirren was Gideon Gideon Meir, the grandson of Helen. He said, I see, I see, I see my grandmother and I see Helen. That's she, just you know, I think she's the one. And Nicholas Martin and the producer said, Okay, so let's let's send her the script and let's see how she I think she she read it and needed to um, so when I met her it was here in LA. She came to my house in the middle of the pandemic with the flip flops, coffee, and just, she was so chill. And came into my house, my kids were running around the house, and we spoke for her for over four hours. It was fascinating. And she told me, you know, God, I'm not Jewish, and, you know, what do you think about it? Will, it? will it be a problem for you? And don't worry if you decide to take the Jewish actress or somebody Israeli, I'm not, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be angry or anything, I'm just giving you the option. And I said, Ellen, you're more Jewish than a lot of Jewish people that I know. <laughs> you, you have the Shema. I, I explained to her what the Shema means, and, and she was like, okay, so if, if you say, because I'm taking your leave, um, and that was the point that we kind of like signed on together on this project and started working on, it, on this project together, and she was totally, fully dedicated and just an amazing person. Didn't she also live in Israel for a while? Yes, yeah, so she was, she was uh, touring the country. She was touring Israel in her, I think she was 29. She fell in love with a Jewish man from England. They went to Kibbutz Haon uh, in Israel. She was hitchhiking and she slept on the beach a lot. Um, and she was just, she fell in love in Israel. It was just after the 67 war. The Six Day War, and she was like, you know, she was uh, in the kibbutz, she was picking, picking tomatoes and moths were falling, um, and she was just, I feel I'm home. That's what she told me. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Um, we'll talk about the relationship with her, um, the working relationship with her on set. So, Helen, you know, with American actors, you just, and, and it's not with Israeli actors, it's not the same method. Um, with American actors, you need to just let them go through the process. And, you know, when Helen came to the set, she was already after a long process of 
of, of, of you know, just um, preparing for the role. Uh, but she did tell me, this guy, don't be afraid to tell me what you think. I mean, I need to hear from you. I need, you, I need feedback from you. So one of the feedbacks was that she was too fast because Golda Meir was more like a turtle. And she was like smoking very, very slow. She was speaking very slow. And so I pulled back um, Helen every time she was too fast. Um, and we had this kind of a relationship during this, um, during a, a, a beautiful relationship. And, and you know, there was one, one night, one day I did not feel good. I didn't sleep all night. I came to the set, I was like, not myself. Nobody saw that, but I tried to hide that. And I was in front of the monitor. Uh, and suddenly I feel this soft hand on my shoulder. I look up and I see Golda. Mm -hmm. And she tells me, Gaijuk, I really want you to tell me that she feel that I want you to feel good. Do you need anything? Soup? Do you want me to make you like tea? Do you want my assistant to, to bring you something? And I said, Are you serious right now? It's like Golda talking to me and asking me that. Ellen sees everyone. She sees the the one person who brings her the towels in the, in the she doesn't have even a line. She told me, please give her, just shoot her um, coming to me, give, give me the towels and say to me something. She just sees everyone and she saw me even when no one else did that. Um, she worked with this, um, it's called animal, um, uh, kind of, it, it's animal method that you become an animal and for instance, uh, you know, Jack Gyllenhaal in this movie that he's, he's playing uh, uh, this guy who chased uh, this videographer who chased accidents in the middle of the night, he was a hyena, you know, because he comes in. She was a turtle and she, she worked with this physicality and it's really helped her working with those um, acting methods in a way. Um, she did take um, kind of a, um, you know, speech, um, I would say, coach. Yeah. And, um, and she was on set with her all the time to make sure she's not slipping from the, from the blue of the accent. Yeah. yeah. No, her, I, she was amazing. Yeah. She, she was, was amazing with that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, she's such an incredible range that we yeah. get another yeah. watching yeah. and actress. Um, were there any surprises? Was there anything that she brought to the role that was unexpected for you? Any surprises? I think that what I like about her is that she's like doing like two takes, and after two takes, she asks, she I ask her, do you need another one? And she asks me, do you? I said, no. I said, so I don't need to. If you could, I'm good. And we, we continue. She she has a lot of self confidence when she comes to the set and doing her thing. But I like also about her that she takes a power nap between uh, one and one forty. She has her trailer, she takes a power nap, nap, and she's like rebooting the whole system and coming back like a new person. And I start to do that too. <laughs> I gotta tell you, it's working beautifully. I'm not ashamed to take a power nap in the middle of the day. That's awesome. <laughs> um, talk about her makeup, how long did the makeup take? Yeah, so Helen, Helen was, you know, when we were sleeping in our hotels, um, we basically came to set at 7.30 for our breakfast, Helen was already on set at 4 a.m. She did the, um, all the prosthetics and everything from 4.30 until 7.30, and when we went back home to the hotel, she stayed another two and a half hours to take off the prosthetics. So she, 78-year-old woman, spent more time on set without an inch of complaining, um, uh, more than us. So oh, she, she just nailed it. It was amazing. Yeah, that, that makeup was really transformative. Um, okay, talk about the rest of the cast. Well, one of the turns for me to making this movie was that I really wanted to make it authentic and to bring Israeli actors to play um, the commanders. And you know, it takes, it takes four months, it's more of a budget to bring all this, um, the five or six cast members from Israel and bring them to the hotel and not to take British actors. But I really wanted to bring the Israeli mentality and to surround Helen, who is not Israeli, 
when the last two Israelis, and that's kind of what was going to film because she was a Milwaukee kind of American. She was an outsider. That's how she felt with all the commanders in the in the thing. Um, so it was just it felt immediately like family because Helen fell in love with Lior and all the, the actors that they just started to have fun. So I looked at it from afar, from the side, and I saw all those commanders are having jokes and having, it's just with gold. It was, it was kind of a surreal moment to have them in a, in a way. And she surprised them. She bought the tickets to a West End play. And she sent them to a West End. All the, all, she called them my boys. Uh, so she sent her boys to and she just missed them. And they met, they just met in Jerusalem. We did a beautiful screening in front of 6,000 people in Jerusalem. And she met them again. It was just a beautiful reunion. So that was such a beautiful way of working with them. Yeah, it sounds like it was really a special cast. Um, what about Camille Cotin? So Camille Cotin, I, I, I'm a big fan of Camille. And she, you know, we didn't find our our assistant, um, and uh, you know, I did a lot of uh, auditions, and I think that Camille came just a week before shooting. Uh, the casting director brought her, and she said, "Why don't you talk to her? She's half Jewish, and you know, she, she she came. She just came from France, from Paris to England with a train. Every few days, she came in and out because of the pandemic. We didn't want to." To stop in the, in the airport. But she was amazing. She was wonderful. They had a great relationship with Helen. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just amazing. Yeah, but she was her assistant, her confidant, for those who don't know who she is. And if you've seen her, she's played a very different role on um, Call My Agent. Yeah, Call My Agent. Call My Agent character. She's funny. She's just amazing. She's an amazing comedian. Yeah, she's, she's another one. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's just amazing. Um, so talk about Helen smoking. How many cigarettes did she smoke? Well, you know, the, the fact that everybody asked me about the cigarette and why we are like smoking all the, all the, all the time in the movie, and first, first of all, Golda smoked like six packs a day. Oh, uh, she was cigarette after cigarette after cigarette. And I'm not even talking about the black coffee she drank. Uh, which was a black coffee after black coffee after black coffee. The entire command room was full of smoke. Constantly, that's what they told me. You couldn't see from one one year. But it was for me it was also a metaphor for this dysfunctional army that couldn't see couldn't see uh, at the, the front. It was kind of a mask of a, a, a big thing of, of smoke. And also the smoke from the from the you know from the engine of all the tanks that they inhale, and so they inhale the smoke, which is kind of like a, you know, a, 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 I would say, she's killing herself slowly, but the country is also killing themselves with a dysfunctional uh, approach for what they do in the war. So it was kind of a metaphor that I thought that would be interesting. So she was almost punishing herself, yeah. and with her cancer, she was. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, speaking of metaphors, I mean, the smoke really is like its own character in the film, which is very interesting, very interesting choice on your part. Um, and also the birds. Talk about the birds. It's another character. Well, it's an Israeli bird that symbolizes freedom. And um, it's kind of like what she saw um, in her mind, and she saw while they were back there. But for me, it's, it's, it also symbolizes the soldiers, the, 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 the soul of, of the soldiers that died, and she died with them, in a way, because she took every single soldier to her heart. So it's kind of a freedom bird that, that dies in the end. That's the uh, flew into the building. Into the building in the yeah, it was very interesting. Uh, just, I mean, this was my third time seeing it. Each time I watch it, there's something new. So I hope you'll all go see it again. <laughs> Um, talk about how long she was and what were the most challenging things for you, again, during COVID. So it was during COVID. Uh, we had to test ourselves every single day. Uh, we, shot, we shot for 35 days uh, in Wembley, outside of London. It was an Indian school, like a giant Indian school with, with 
high ceilings. Um, Aram Shawat, who is my uh, production designer, uh, went to Israel and, and basically copied every single room in the Kira, in the, in the, you know, in Golda's kitchen and built it from scratch in this, uh, in the school. So we had an entire, um, uh, kind of like bunker and Golda's house, everything was in this school that was massive. Wow. Yeah, we built it from scratch. So talk about what were the biggest challenges? The biggest challenges was COVID because we had like people falling like flies um, because of COVID, it was like, crazy and um, to basically keep the authenticity of, of the experience it's not so easy to keep the the core of the you know of the of making it right and um, yeah it's just it's just a period so it's, it's more challenging well, I think you build the authenticity of it really you know um, I also love the way you intertwined the stock footage yeah. into it. It just brought it, 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 brought it all together. Um, and can you talk about her dream sequence? Uh, Golda had a uh, nightmare that she spoke about, uh, especially the phone one. She was waking up at night and there was a phone ringing, and another phone, and another phone, and another phone. And she couldn't stop this ringing. And every time she answered the phone, there was another kind of a casualty information that came to her. Um, and so she spoke about it, um, and, and we kind of wanted to bring this nightmare into, because she couldn't go to the front, the front came to her, in a way, in her dreams. So, and then the smoke and everything, and that was something that I wanted to bring as kind of a, this whole movie is kind of like a long nightmare, in a way, it's kind of a, you know, and then it, it, it was something I wanted to try. Well, speaking of bringing the front to her, every time she went into her cancer treatments, there were just more bodies. Yes, more bodies in the morgue, yeah. Um, you made a lot of very interesting choices as an artist, and I just wanted to commend you on creating a really beautiful film. Very thought-provoking and very heartfelt. Um, I want to also talk about the music and the sound design. Yeah, so the, the sound the sound design is designed by Nick Adili, uh, another Israeli uh, very talented man who won an Oscar for Gravity. He did the sound for Gravity. I really wanted to work with him for long, many, many years. And he's, he lives in London, and his father was in the Yom Kippur War, in my age. And we just bonded over that, and over this movie, and he did a beautiful... It took him like two months to do the sound for this movie, but I think he nailed it. And, it's one of my, my, my it's, it's very effective, yeah, yeah. And Dasha, Dasha is a uh, German lady who is my, who I found uh, in this movie, who's an amazing, amazing um, composer. And she composing also my next movie, Tatami, about the Iranian um, project that I'm doing. So it's an affair that started in, in Golda, and I hope we'll, we'll do many, many movies together because she's very talented. Wonderful. Um, and then the choice of music at the end. The Earth Coin uh, song was so many times in and out, in and out in the movie because you know it, it cost a lot of money, something like forty thousand dollars just to buy this song, and uh, you need also the the Earth Coin state to approve this song. So you know just to get it right to get it, to get this, this song into the movie it was. So it was, I can't tell you how many anxiety, how much anxiety I had by not having it. Yes, yes, we have it. Uh, we don't have it. We have it. We don't have it. And then at the end, the state, because the North Korea was in the war, and we went to Israel and he tore the front. Um, that's why uh, the state gave us uh, discounts. And the song was in, and this is the song that he wrote on the war after he came back from Israel. It's in his record, um, and that's, 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 that's the song about what he experienced. That's amazing. Well, you heard it here first. <laughs> um, you mentioned the film that you're working on now. You just finished shooting an Iranian film. Or yeah, that, that's very exciting. It's, it's called Tatami. Um, it's, uh, I directed it with an Iranian director named Zahar Ibrahimi. 
she just won um, Cannes last year uh, with her Holy Spider movie. She's very, very talented. I wrote it with Ilham Arfani. Um, and it's about the Iranian judo fighter who uh, is going to win the gold in the World Cup, in the World, in the world, in the world uh, Championship. And uh, after the third fight that she's winning, and the third fight the Israeli winning, she's getting a phone call from the, uh, from, the from Iran, from the government, saying a board mission, you're not allowed to compete versus the Zionists, the Zionist traitor Zionists. She said, you know what? Fuck you. I'm gonna go in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the gold. And I don't, I don't, I don't care. I, I trained for this moment for the last three years. I'm going in. So every time that she's going in for the fight, she's paying the she paying the price back home. They're arresting her family and they squeezing her. They're sending people from the embassy uh, to the stadium and they threaten her and her coach. She's like, do I, who do I follow? Do I follow the government? Do I follow my, the, you know, the, my heart? And that's kind of like uh, one night in the stadium. It's kind of a um, political thriller. When that one comes out. Um, my last question is, this film opened the Jerusalem Film Festival to, what, about five, 6,000 people? Yeah, 6,000 people. So how was it received? It was amazing. Um, we, we invited a lot of war veterans, um, and the, the response we got was overwhelming. 